Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Good early evening. Good early afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. Thanks for joining us. Hello, hello. I recognize some names. Thanks for joining us again. We are very excited to have you all with us today. We're going to get started in just a moment. Um, we do have a couple of little things to take care of, or one little thing anyway. We do have an attendance link, so if you could take a moment to go ahead and click the attendance link that Linda just tossed into chat, that would be great. Um, it's codehs.com slash p5js dash dash physics. I'm not even going to say it. It's in the chat. <laughs> go ahead and click it. <laughs> I started reading it and thought, what did I make that? That's very long. <laughs> You will want to click the attendance link uh, that will let us know that you are here and will let us send you a certificate of attendance. So make sure you click the attendance link. Hey, Mark, it's good to see you here. You can, um, let's see, go ahead and uh, drop your uh, introduction into chat if you would like. Mark, I think you were at Tuesdays too, if I remember right. Yes, you were. Yep. Great to see you here. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, go ahead and drop your uh, drop an introduction into chat. Tell us where you're joining us from. We love to know who's joining us at our workshops. All right. Hello, hi George. So glad you're you've joined us today. This is one of my favorite new topics. Uh, in coding in CS. I'm very excited about P5JS. I'm glad you're here. Mark, you are so right. Tuesdays was challenging. Um, yeah, if you were new to Java, Tuesdays uh, definitely went into the weeds a little bit with Java. And if you're like me, or I might be just a little bit on the math challenge side, I definitely had to focus in on the multiplicative digital root to make sure I knew what I was doing. Um, Hey, and keep an eye on those free PDs because we might have some Java stuff over the summer too if you're looking for more there. Um, hi, Tiffany. Hello, hello. Oh, Northern California, and you're teaching sixth and seventh graders. That is awesome. Hello, hi, Nathan. Ah, from Canada. Welcome. All right. Okay. So let's all get settled in. Make sure to click that attendance link if you haven't. Uh, Chip, let's go ahead and head to that next slide. Okay, so there's going to be some links that you're going to want today. Um, our amazing teacher trainer, Chip Kramlick, has uh, created a lot of sandboxes for you to take a look at. <clears throat> so if you want all of those links, uh, we'll be tossing those into chat as we go. But you can easily grab this link um, and have the slides right in front of you and all the links will be there as well. Um, you can also scan that QR code if that's a little bit easier for you to grab the slides for now. And as always, I will make sure to include this slide deck when I send out the follow-up email after this workshop. All right, let's go ahead and go to that next slide. All right, and I'm pretty sure all of you have CodeHS accounts, but just in case, please go to CodeHS.com slash sign up to create one. I am thinking this is our CodeHS crew, so pretty sure we don't have to pause too long on this. Now, without further ado, I want to introduce you all to one of our amazing teacher trainers, Chip Kramlick. I'm so excited. He is back to do a P5JS workshop with us today. Um, and you are all going to love this. So instead of me talking, I'm going to turn this over to Chip. Take okay. it away, sir. Hello, everybody. Um, again, Chip Kramlick. Um, I'm a high school computer science teacher. I teach... Um, a lot of different courses. I teach both the AP classes and some other stuff. Um, I've been working with P5JS and processing for, I'd say about seven, eight years. Uh, I've got a background in computer graphics. It's kind of what I majored in in college. And playing with this just brings so much of what I learned back in college uh, back. And hopefully you'll find some enjoyment in what we're doing. Uh, P5JS, for those that don't understand what it is, it's pretty much a add-in package for JavaScript. 
Now processing is its own language and you can run that on your own computer. It looks very similar, just a few little changes between Java and JavaScript. But this allows you to do graphics, in my opinion, in a much easier way than the JavaScript graphics that's built into JavaScript. The uh, elements that you use are much easier to define. And this also provides an interface for actually doing animation. And when you're doing animation, you got to bring into the physics side, which is kind of some of the things I'm going to actually talk about today. So first thing is looking at what the basics of the P5JS program actually look like. Now, typically, uh, the way it's laid out, you have your global variables up at the top. And the one thing uh, with P5JS is you're going to use global variables. There's really no way of getting around not using them. They're just kind of there. And it's the best way of actually working with data uh, through multiple functions. Next is your setup function. So function setup. The way P5JS works is the background of the actual API calls setup when you're start, first starting uh, the program. So this configures what your drawing canvas is. You can set up uh, how it's going to deal with ellipses and rectangles where the center actually is. And you can set up some other things that you just need to run once. So setup just gets run once at the start. The main thing we're going to look at today is what's actually called draw. So every time the screen needs to update, it's going to call draw to refresh the screen. And this is where you can actually get the stuff to do the animations. Um, so along with that, there are some built-in variables. First one is mouse X, mouse Y. It can actually keep track of where the mouse is on the screen. And you can use these values to actually do some really cool things. Um, so you also have P mouse X, P mouse Y, the previous one. So I've got a little example program here. I'm going to go ahead and switch over to my sandbox and bring up the program that goes along with this one. Now, uh, we're going to start off just with the top part. We'll do a part two in a bit. So again, global variables at the top. I'm just using one called index. That's actually going to get used a little bit later. But here's my setup. And again, what I'm doing is just some basic things to configure the system. Uh, create canvas, that sets your drawing area, how big you want it and its width and height. Now, if you've never worked with computer graphics before, the one thing with computer graphics is they've kind of mirrored uh, quadrant one of the coordinate plane. So X still increases as we go to the right, Y increases as we go down. So this is kind of backwards from what you're actually doing math class. And you really do need to explain this to students. But most students really pick this up a lot, or pick it up easy. And it's this way with most graphics programs or most um, APIs that draw. Um, I've got students that fully understand it now when we're using different other systems. So it takes them a little bit, but they get it. So what I'm doing here is like line seven, I'm setting the color that I'm actually going to uh, paint with. Uh, and then how wide is the brush? That's stroke weight. And then background. So you can set your background color. It sets the whole background. Now, there's multiple ways of setting color. I'm using pretty much the web-based version using the hex triplets. So again, hashtag, the first two are red, the next two are green, last two are blue. So we're going to get a blue background. But the main thing here is the draw function. First, we're going to draw lines from the previous mouse location to the current mouse location. When I actually run this, what this gives us is a way of drawing on the screen. So it's taking the previous mouse location and just allowing it. And from there, I can actually create a little paint program. Fairly simple. And it's just literally one line of code in the draw. Just drawing a line and keep drawing a line and it keeps drawing over and over again. That's cool. It does some stuff, but let's add a little more. So you also have, this is also an event-driven uh, language. So we can work off events like pressing the mouse or pressing the keyboard. So I've added in a couple of new features. So here, if mouse is pressed, we're going to change, uh, we're going to just redraw the background. And if they press a key, based off the value, we're going to keep increase, increasing the value of index every time we click it. It'll change it from green to purple to red and to orange. Simple, if you understand um, JavaScript or even Java, you can kind of see exactly what's going on. We're doing a modulus, just returning the remainder. If I divide a number by four and I look at the remainder, it's going to be zero, one, two, or three. So I can cycle through all four from that. Now, in my paint program, I've got that as part two. 
So I'm going to uncomment part two here and activate those parts. And what you'll see here is mouse press is going to draw the background. This is the first thing I want to show. So I'm going to go ahead and clear it and rerun it. And I start drawing and it's like, oops, I made a mistake. Well, what I can do is click the mouse that redraws the background. So it kind of clears it out. And I can draw again and click the mouse and it'll redraw it. Now I start drawing and now I can use key pressed. And this changes the color. So you can actually create a simple little paint program with just a few lines and actually have it draw. Now I've done mine as really simplistic, but this kind of shows you some of the features that you can do with P5JS. Really interesting and some of the stuff you can actually activate. So that's going from that point. Let's move on. Now, the main thing I really want to get to today is the animation and the uh, um, physics side of things. So as we said here, uh, we have set up and draw. Well, the animations work like a flipbook. If you've ever done a flipbook, you know, you draw a page, something on a page, you put the next page down, you draw it, you do it, and you go from there. Uh, that's the way this actually works. You're drawing something on the screen, and then to redraw it, you draw the background, and then you draw what you do again. This is all being handled inside of draw. So we've got another demo we're going to look at inside the sandbox. And this one I've got right here. So I'm going to show you a couple of things as to how this works. We're starting off, instead of drawing a line this time, I'm just drawing um, uh, an ellipse. And I'm just using the mouse X and mouse Y. Now you'll notice that background is being used up here in the setup. So it's only being called at the start. So when I run this, we still get that paint program kind of thing, but it's drawing an ellipse instead of drawing lines. Now, I'm just making one change. I'm making taking the background out of the setup and putting it down here in draw. So now, when you put background in draw, it needs to be the very first thing because we want to refresh the page before we draw something. And what that gives us is a totally new thing. We can see how the ellipse follows the mouse. We now have animation, a flipbook kind of animation. So pretty straightforward. And again, if you look at the code, really simple, done very easily. It doesn't take a whole lot to actually create this stuff. Okay. So now we're going to get into the fun stuff, which is dealing with the physics. If you've ever watched any cartoon or any movie that deals with animation, these are things that animators actually work with. It's like dealing with the actual physics behind the scenes. How do you get something to appear to move on the screen? Now, uh, in real life, we see things and we're seeing constant movement. But when you're dealing with animation and computer graphics, you're dealing with something called persistence of vision or simulating movement. And what that means is we're trying to make, we're changing things, but it's not consistent. You're getting a frame and then you get another frame, but they're happening so fast, the human eye doesn't see that. The human eye and brain interpret it as actual movement. That's called persistence of vision. There's other ways of doing it. Um, I've done it with um, LEDs and other things that we can work with with hardware, but also with computer graphics, that's the key point. Now, with persistence of vision, what you're looking at are frame rates that are at around 60 times a second. And that's what the human eye can actually register. So if it's a little slower, they're going to see the actual jumpiness. But we don't need to control the frame rate at this point. It's handled behind the scenes for us with um, uh, P5JS. Let me go ahead and get my velocity. Let's see. No bounce. Okay. So I'm going to do a little bit of the physics and math on this one and cover what's actually going on. So with velocity, if you've ever studied anything with physical science or physics, velocity is nothing but the change in distance over time. So let's look at our global variables we have. We have our x position and our velocity for x. We have our y position and our velocity for y. The rest of this lines three and four are just setting up our information to draw our ellipse. What we really care about is actually making this thing move. So our setup, again, it's initialization. We only call it once. So here we're setting our initial position for our ellipse, which is going to be the radius. 
And for this first pass, I'm actually setting the uh, Y position of ours to be halfway down the screen. Now, we look at back uh, function, uh, function draw, our background is set to zero. We're drawing our lips based off of X pause, Y pause. And then this line here, the X position is gonna be increased by the value of the velocity. So this is where we actually, because you know, we're changing our position and that's what velocity does. So this gives us our basic animation. So if we run this, we see it move slowly across the screen. Well, if I want it to move faster, I can easily just come in here and change the X velocity to like three. And I rerun it and it moves even faster across the screen. So it's actually our velocity that we're actually setting. I'm just watching a ball go across the screen, not a whole lot. Let's actually make it move in two dimensions. So we're going to bring in our Y uh, component. So I'm going to uncomment this. And instead of doing Y from the middle, we're going to do Y from the top. And I'm also going to add in our Y velocity. So now we're not just changing our X component, our horizontal component. We're also changing our vertical component or our Y component. So if we let me make sure I've got everything set right, yep, got clear it and run it again. Now we get it and it moves at an angle. And I've got the X set at a higher value. So I'm going to put X back down to one and clear and run again. And we can see how it's moving. So if here the X and Y are the same, when it was different, it works there. But again, you want to see a ball bounce. You don't want to see it just go off the screen. So that takes us to the next part. So we've dealt with the velocity. Again, this is just a copy of the code. So you've got it in the slide and you can always refer back to it. Um, simple elastic collisions. So what we want to do here is we want it to hit the edge and bounce off. Now, the first time I started writing this code, when I was doing it, half the ball would be off the screen and then it would actually reflect back. When we're talking about elastic collisions, what we're looking at is changing the direction of the velocity. So going back really quick, if we look at the right side here, the ball is approaching and run it. When it hits the right side of the screen, it should bounce back to the left. And if it hit the bottom, we would expect it to go back up. So the left and right sides are gonna change the velocity on the horizontal or X component. The top and the bottom are gonna change the velocity on the vertical or the Y component. The easiest way with an elastic one is all I have to do is multiply the velocity by negative one. If I'm moving to the right, I have a positive velocity. If I'm moving to the left, I have a negative velocity in the horizontal. For vertical, if I'm moving down, I have a positive. If I'm moving up, I have a negative. So what we've got here is new variables, x direction, which is set to one, y direction set to one, and then we've made changes to draw. In this case, what we're doing is we're just taking the velocity and multiplying it by the direction for both X and Y. And then these if statements are what I'm actually doing. I'm gonna go bring up the code and I can go a little more in detail as to what's going on with uh, that one. So let's velocity 2D bounce. So what we're looking at, if the position of the ellipse is less than the radius, then I know it's on the left-hand side. If the position of the ellipse is greater than the width of the screen minus the radius. Yeah, let me make sure to recap this. You have built-in variables with P5JS. You have width and you have height. This is the width, this is the height. So P5JS sets these variables after you call create canvas. So this tells me I'm on the right-hand side of the screen. This tells me I'm at the bottom of the screen. So if I'm on the right-hand side, or if I'm on the left-hand side, I need to change the direction of the velocity. So I'm just multiplying it by negative one. Because one times negative one is negative one, negative one times negative one is positive one. It will just flip back and forth. Really makes it easy to do this. So the first if statement is dealing it with the left and right side. The second if statement is dealing with the top and the bottom. So if we go through here, save it, run it, and now we actually can watch it bounce off the edges. 
but it's moving kind of slow. So again, this is a event-driven language. So we look down here, if you press the mouse, I'm increasing the velocity by one for the X or horizontal. If you press a key, increasing it for the Y. So we'll click the mouse. It's moving a little faster horizontally. Click the mouse again, moves a little faster. Click the keyboard, moving faster vertically. And we go faster vertically. And we can keep doing this and cause it to do a lot of things. And something if you really want to see, remember what I said about background is what really makes things change. If I take the background, I put it back in the setup, you do get something really cool that shows up. Again, this is the fun thing you just get to play with it and see what happens. Couldn't even put that back there. Save it, we run it. Now it's tracing, but let's actually increase it. And you can actually see how the paths change because it follows and it bounces around. So we make it go faster, we can draw the lines. So you can actually see a little bit more when you do it. And based off, again, background's a key piece with your animation. As long as you keep it in uh, draw, it does it. Otherwise, you get a paint program. I'm going to put it back there. Okay, I'm moving kind of fast, but we'll keep going because uh, are there any questions at this point? Yeah, as, uh, if you place this under both of your if statements, the physics gets weird. Vx plus equals two. Um, yeah, I, I try to keep, uh, that's where like Vx plus equals. If you do it in there, as you'll see in a second, you're now actually modifying it and you actually get acceleration, which is why we just want to keep it. I, I keep the change in the velocity as separate items because that becomes acceleration at that point which is what we're getting to next. So we've done simple elastic collisions. Now we'll talk about acceleration. So in physics, like velocity is a change in distance over time. Acceleration is a change in velocity over time. So uh, this one was, I found this one a little bit difficult to actually write, but I know there's ways of doing it. So going to this one, let's look at acceleration. And here, what you'll see is I've got Vx plus equals Ax. So we've added a few more variables. We've added, uh, I'm only accelerating at this point in the horizontal. So I've got Ax as what I'm doing. And I'm making that change here to accelerate it. So it changes every time it bounces. As you see here, and this time, no hands, I'm not touching anything. It's anytime it bounces on the horizontal, it increases the horizontal velocity, so I get acceleration. I said, that's great, what can I do with it? Well, animators use acceleration at the start and stop of motion. Things don't automatically start at 50 uh, feet per second or meters per second, whatever your, your unit is. They have to ramp up. So they do what's called a stretch and a squish. You stretch it to show that starting. So you may have to have some little routine if you want smooth animation instead of just automatic starting, have that ramp up to your velocity using acceleration. And then it's gonna stop, you ramp it down, decreasing the velocity, again, using acceleration. In that case, deceleration. So the next piece is actually looking at from a physics point of view. Okay, acceleration is great, but real time you only see it is when you're dealing with gravity. This was a fun one to write because uh, while I don't teach physics, I get a lot of students who come to me for physics help. And I explain that to them specifically when they get to two-dimensional uh, kinematics, uh, they don't understand that the motion is only affected in one direction, in the vertical. Your horizontal speed stays the same. Your vertical speed is what's changing. So let's go ahead and look at this one, which is trajectory. Now, I'll go through the code real quick. There is a little bit, it's a little more complex than the previous ones. Um, so this time I've only got acceleration in the A. And what you'll notice here is I've got a decimal value, but it is positive. And remember, Y increases as I go down. So what I wanna do here 
because I need my acceleration to be a positive value. So it's going to pull things down. Now to do trajectory, I need to shoot up. So my initial velocity is a negative value. So I want it to go in an upward direction. And again, I'm going to shoot across the screen. So my velocity horizontal is a positive value of six. And from that point, we're just drawing our lips. We're changing our position based on our velocity like we've done in all the other ones. But here, we're modifying our velocity in the Y by adding in our acceleration. So we start off with a negative value, but I'm adding in a positive. And then, um, let's see, this is just to make sure where I'm shooting, it stays in the right spot. And that once it goes off the screen, it can reset because that's what these if statements really are. It's just, I want it to reset and start again. So here, uh, if it's greater than the height, I'm just changing the height minus the radius so it stays. And here, if it goes off the screen, I want it to restart from that point. So if we pretty much run it, you can see we have trajectory motion. Now, is there a way of slowing this down? There is, it's changing the frame rate, but again, uh, I can reduce the velocity a little bit on the uh, horizontal. And you can kind of see, but then it just drops. So you can see how it, it doesn't bounce. I don't have the bouncing set, but you can see that we do have trajectory motion. Um, jump back up to let's say four. Let's change the vertical to seven. Make it go up a little higher. Again. Now, when I was in high school, um, there was a simple little game called uh, what was it called? It was like a little tank valve, but you just your tanks didn't move. Artillery. And you shot, and you had to choose the angle and the amount of force. And it did this calculation. It drew the lines. It didn't do an animation, but it drew a line and you tried to shoot your other person's tank. And it's always been one of the things like, okay, well, how do I actually do it? And this is pretty much the basic concept of doing that piece. Okay, so that's trajectory. I'm going to clear so it stops running. Um, okay, so that's what I've got with the basics of physics. If you guys have questions, I'll be more than happy to answer. Just checking to see if I've missed anything in chat. Don't think so. Does anybody have any questions? I will say one of the best ways to really get into using P5JS and processing is just to try it. Um, I know um, we have a middle school teacher with us. Uh, we have high school teachers with us. I think this is great for um, either level, any level. Um, I know I've, I've definitely seen some middle school teachers use this with their classes and it's really engaging for kids. Yeah, and they've got a website, P5JS, all kinds of stuff. You can actually, you can write your code here. You can do it in, in uh, uh, Code HS. Uh, you can even create your own web pages. So as long as you include the P5JS uh, script, you can actually embed this in your own web page and have it as part of your web page. Uh, plenty of examples. If you want to learn how to do something specific, they've got some. So they go more in depth than what I've done. Uh, they get into the particle motion, um, doing recursion. So if you're teaching recursion, they've got stuff for that. Uh, they even get into 3D. So definitely a really cool API that you can add into your JavaScript. And this is definitely something I, that resource I've gone back to time and time again. And I'll say that, um, Actually, the reason I really started getting into it is because of Chip. So after your workshop last year, and I absolutely loved it. Um, George mentioned, any thoughts on using nature of code? Is that, um, oh, his name, not Shilman, Schiffman? I think that's, yep, Dan Schiffman. Uh, um, the writers of uh, one of the books. So I believe if you look at, let's see. Books. I think he's got one of them. 
and we may be the one that did that uh, processing. But uh, the whole purpose behind this and processing was to bring uh, coding to those who don't code. Um, let's see. That's, I know I've seen Schiffman's name somewhere. And some of the stuff you could do, I've seen a lot of stuff where people work with, I mean, I'm a big fan of like dealing with the Fibonacci numbers and the uh, golden ratio, and you can draw stuff out with that. So showing, and I get my students involved with showing how this is part of nature. If you actually look at the curves in a pine cone going one direction versus the other, and you count how many curves in each direction, they actually end up being two of the numbers in the Fibonacci sequence. Um, I know I've definitely used um, yeah, Dan and Shipman, Nature. Yeah, Korea. there you go. Yeah, and he's got it. He does it with processing, which is a processing was the original language. P5JS was a development from processing. So there's uh, you can work from there. And again, he's doing kind of the same kind of thing with uh, working it from that point of view. So yeah, George, you are right. You can, yeah, Fibonacci is way cool. Um, yeah. I uh, get the uh, little, um, they, you know, cut um, all the shells in half and you examine the spiral and the spiral is a Fibonacci sequence. So all this fun stuff that goes along with math that's in the real world. Exactly. And I'll say Shipman is one of my favorites. Um, I am constantly, when I'm looking for something or trying to figure something out, I'm always running across um, something that he's done. And it has helped me immensely. I feel like I've grown a lot just reading Dan Schiffman. So awesome resource. Any other? I'm definitely going to check out that because um, I, I know I've seen the book and I thought, well, maybe I should buy that book. And then I bought some other ones instead. But I'm not opposed to buying a lot of books. So, <laughs> yeah, Oh, cool. You met him once. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. yeah he, he did learning processing. He's Yeah. Oh but, yeah. Yep. There you go. This is this orange book here is the quintessential book to use. If you want to, it works as a great textbook. Uh, again, this is in processing, but the change between processing and P5JS is very easy, very simple. Um, he does a great job. Um, some of the stuff I've actually got his book online. Let's just see. Uh, let me do it on the tab over here first. Now I'm going to get over it. Tiffany asked a question is there a P5JS course for students coming there is mm -hmm. yes it is launching I believe the second week of May am I, am I right on that Lori I think so I think so so keep an eye out for that I mean, and when you, oh, go ahead, Chip. Sorry. He have struggled with the uh, JavaScript coding, I'm not trying to uh, dis code HS or anything for that, but my students have always struggled with that specific piece. And then when we play some with people job 5 js they're like, well, why aren't we doing that? <laughs> so I'm in the process of redoing some of their lessons for myself using uh, P5JS just to make it a little easier because there's less to deal with with the complexity uh, of it. Um, oh, okay, got, okay, let's have people. Oh, cool. Excellent. Oh, we'll definitely be checking that out. Cool. And we'll definitely be uh, chatting with Chip about those lessons that he's redoing, and maybe he can do some workshops for us. <laughs> 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 I mean, like Get more ideas. Done is so much easier if you're doing it with P5JS because it's done a little easier. Let me get to the table of contents. Uh, okay. Thanks for sharing that link as well, George. Okay, so I'll go. Cool. So this is uh, what he covers, and some of the stuff is really simple. Uh, again, you could use this book as an actual uh, textbook. Um, just uh, uh, get to the beginning, because he starts off just 
he, he explains what computer graphics is, how it works. So he's going over like what a pixel is, and he's got the links for the processing, how to do some basics. He's got exercises in here that you can work through, you know, English versus code. Because again, the whole point was this is a programming language, or in this case for FiveJS, an API that was designed for non-programmers, designed for artists and uh, others like that. So he covers a lot of the basics as to how things work, but then you get into uh, dealing with color, how color works. Um, so if you want to introduce computer graphics to uh, students, this is an excellent way of doing it. And the fun part is getting them to create Zoog here, this little alien. Uh, we did it earlier this year, and I let them do it, and then they get to modify them. And instead of just being gray and black and white, Make them yourself, make changes to it, but it gives you the code. Uh, and again, it's very simple, it explains it, how it is. And as you can see here, it's similar. The commands are the same from processing as they are to P5.js. The only big difference between processing and P5.js is Java uses void and um, JavaScript uses function. Other than that, it's pretty much the same. I've really found too that it is very, very accessible. So I think this is a great, a great entry point for students. I think it's great for middle school students, um, high school students. It's super engaging. So love that you're all here to learn more about this. Yeah, um, and we're getting all these other resources now too. So <laughs> like you find some more books. Uh, science with like physics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is great. Thank you so much. All right, do we have any other questions? We've got some really cool links in chat. Got a sneak peek of what's coming out in Code HS and a sneak peek for what we'll be asking Chip for more sessions on. <laughs> all right, so everybody, we have some more resources for all of you as well. Um, we've got a few links in the slide deck and we can definitely share these out again with, uh, with that follow-up email. If you are not a Code HS certified educator, I highly recommend doing that. Um, you can earn a Code HS micro credential in several languages. Um, we have web design and we have uh, cybersecurity also. Um, also, keep an eye on that free PD page. Linda just tossed that link into chat, codehs.com slash free PD. There will be a ton of workshops coming in the next week or probably the next two weeks, um, but you're gonna see a ton more on there. And just a little side note, Chip is doing another session next week on customizing quizzes in Code HS and using, are we doing a little markdown in that one, Chip? Definitely doing markdown. Yes. One of the key things that um, with quizzes, you if you're writing a quiz and you're dealing with code, how do you actually get the code to display correctly? Yes, exactly. So that's gonna be an awesome workshop. And if you didn't know you could customize your Code HS course, you can whether you're a free teacher or a pro teacher. So pretty cool. Um, check out our Code HS course catalog, join the Facebook group, follow us on social media. Another quick little note, we also have uh, applications open now for the next cohort of teacher trainers. So if you're thinking, you know, I think I'd like to join CHIP and uh, deliver some of these sessions, definitely check that out. I'll make sure that that link goes out with the uh, follow-up email as well. Don't hesitate to check into it or ask me any questions if you have questions about the teacher trainer program. Uh, let's go ahead and hit that next slide. Oh, yep, upcoming workshops. I put that in there. I didn't even have to give my whole thing the last slide. But next week, Thursday, so make sure you head out to codehs.com slash free PD. Uh, our... April 5th. Oh, it's May 5th. <laughs> yeah, it's not April 5th. That's done. <laughs> We're so past April. All right. Yeah, I'll fix that we'll before we send that out. With, uh, code HS. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, you'll see it right on the site. Okay, let's just get past that, okay. that whole typo. Remember how I said I checked that chip? <laughs> 
All right, we have one last thing for all of you. If you could just take a moment to go ahead and fill out our workshop survey. Linda, toss that link into chat, codehs.com slash workshop survey. We would love to know what you thought of everything tonight and what else can we give you? We always want to know what do you need? We want to make sure we're responsive to what our teachers need. So let us know what you would like to see and uh, we'll be more than happy to try to make that happen for you. And I think that's it. Tiffany, thank you so much for coming. Um, it was great to connect with you as well. Thank you, everybody, for coming. We know that this is a crazy busy time of year. And the fact that you took time away from your busy schedule to spend time with us, uh, we're just very grateful. So thank you so much for choosing to come to our workshop this evening. Uh, we hope to see you at another workshop very soon. And Chip, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was awesome. I just want to go code stuff now, and I'm going to go make a little robot after this. And uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening, and we look forward to seeing you at the next Code HS workshop. See you soon.